Good morning, Moms of Master Books. Welcome to Teaching Tips Thursday. Today we're going to talk about helping our kids stay in better brain. Uh, part three of the series, Emotional Health and Practical Coaching Tips that we can use with our kids and apply to our kids. Hey, uh, if you're watching, be sure to comment for a chance to have 2,500 reward points added to your account. Uh, we'll be choosing a name in the future for that. So um, the last two posts, we've talked about um, an emotionally healthy response, right? Um, not reacting from an emotional standpoint, but more from a creative standpoint. And so today we're going to talk about a little bit more of a practical um, application. And, and let's end it with talking about um, that math meltdown. Uh, I don't know that I have the answers for, for math meltdowns because I probably still would have my own. But um, I think we can move that direction. And I think that a good thing that we can do in this is um, with our kids, every child is different and every parent is different, situations are different. And so what we have to do is, is we have to be creative and we have to um, try new things. It's experimentation and, and abandon those things that fail quickly. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, I'd like to show a different model, if I can, than I did um, previously for an emotional health. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna switch over to, um, to the different view. Okay. So on the whiteboard here, um, I'm going to draw one line here. Forgive the handwriting. Right here we have a, um, a situation or a stimulus. Over here we have our response. In here is one of the most blessed things that we have. It is... Health is in here. This is the opportunity to choose how we respond between the stimulus and the response. Okay, so um, we have this gift. Something happens and we respond. Now, if we do this often enough, it just becomes a habit and we don't often think about it, but we can train ourselves that when something happens or occurs here, um, before we respond, that we think about it and we begin to ask ourselves questions and analyze what's really happening. And so something we can do is say, um, for as an adult, I can say, Okay, somebody just came in and they said something offensive. Now, before I respond, what I can ask myself, a question to help move out of a bad brain spot, an emotional spot, is I can begin to ask myself, um, what kind of person do I want to be in this situation? Uh, what's important to me in this situation? Now, one of the things that happens in this spot is we will get counsel from our emotions. And a lot of times as adults, I guess we have a little bit off here. Um, as adults, pick this up, there we go. As adults, there's a series of backdrops that play into this from our past. And our emotions often will give us um, some underlying value that, that perhaps has been violated. So we respond from fear, we respond in anger, helplessness, um, and being overwhelmed, that's the emotion. Something that's important, I've heard this recently, I absolutely love it, is our emotions give us good data, but they don't necessarily mean, they're, they're not necessarily directives. Just because I feel, um, I feel fear in a situation, that gives me good data. I can look at it and say, well, why would I feel fear? What in this situation reminds me of something to be fearful of? But that doesn't mean that it's a directive. It doesn't mean I have to act out of fear. It means I can take counsel of my emotion, if that makes sense, but I'm not necessarily required to act on that emotion. And so what I'm doing in this spot of um, stimulation or stimulus to response is teaching myself to ask questions and how I want to respond. And in just asking the question of who do I want to become in this spot, I actually 
um, move from a unhealthy emotional response to a healthier creative response. Okay. Okay. That's in that's in code in case anybody wants to know. So that's the model, especially as adults. The older we get, we can continually go back and ask ourselves, um, it, okay, something happens. What is the what is my emotion? What is the underlying emotional response to this? And then how I respond. Um, something uh, as an adult, um, Kristen and I in our marriage, uh, it would be really important to her that I would go through the house and lock up the doors at night and make sure the house was secure. Okay. Well, to me, maybe it was important. Maybe it wasn't important. And so, um, sometimes I would do it. Sometimes I wouldn't do it. Well, she would react angry because that was, um, that was communicating a lot of things. It was communicating that I was unsafe because I wasn't making sure the family was safe. It was communicating um, a lot of different emotions. What I, what I had to do rather than responding to the response was try to understand what was the emotion, what was, what was there. And, and, and in understanding, well, as a 250 pound male versus a 100 pound female, as a six foot man versus a five foot woman, um, I think a lot differently. I'm not as worried about someone coming into the house at night, maybe I should be, as, as she was. And so when I began to look at the underlying emotion and, and what kind of person do I want to be in this situation and what is, what is the really happening here as opposed to she responds and then I respond and then she responds and we're just in an emotional and healthy place, we're looking at more creative a more creative response. So that allows me to kind of interject in there in this window of opportunity that we have between the stimulus and response. Hopefully that's making some sense for everybody. Okay, so let's talk about our kids because our kids, especially um, elementary age students and, and, and younger students, they don't necessarily always have as much life experience as we do. So we're helping them develop the emotions as well as helping them understand how to interject the emotional response with a more creative response. So um, sometimes the question isn't just uh, what kind of person do I want to be here, but it's, it's, it's more as a coach asking what kind of person do I want to help my child be here. So in, in like math, we may think of math as a benign subject and, and in many ways, um, you know, every day we do it and, and we have to get through it and then we move on. But today it's math. In our students' lives, it may be tomorrow, it may be a job that, that is sometimes difficult. It may be marriage that has its challenges. It may be um, paying our taxes. Whatever it is, we're going to encounter things in life that are going to challenge us, that are going to be difficult, that may be mundane, um, and we have to learn to, to work through those challenges. And so uh, with our students, we, we want to look for opportunities in these challenges. So the math meltdown is one that a lot of homeschool moms have had to feel. Okay, so that's, that's a good place to, let's look at a different perspective here. This is a good opportunity for us as parents to start training our students. So the first thing that we need to ask is, when it comes to education and coaching, right? Because this is essentially what we're doing here. We're coaching, we're training, we're discipling. It's not just I'm the mom, you're the kid, do the work because I said so and I'm the boss. It's really we're training them. We're training them to handle difficult situations emotionally. We're training them to self-educate, self-learn. We're training them self-discipline and self-control. All of these things. Math is a really good opportunity for that. Um, I think something that's, that's very important for us as the adult, as the parent, is to make sure we're emotionally healthy. Uh, if, if 
I'm frustrated by having to sit down, stop what I'm doing and spend time with my child doing math, um, then that's not going to be helpful for them because they're going to mirror my response. So I have to make sure I'm in a healthy spot, that I look at this as an opportunity, that this is a good teaching moment. It's a good time for me to train my child. It's not just about we have to get through another page of math. It's I'm actually preparing them now so that when they're 20, 25, 30, I don't still have a child on my hands. So <clears throat> we're, we're working to prepare them for independence from us and to be emotionally healthy. Um, I think we have to disconnect a little bit as adults too from our children. Do you know how easy it is that when my children are frustrated, I become frustrated. When they're sinful, I feel like I'm sinful. When um, they're, they're not a superstar at whatever they're doing, then I'm not a superstar at what they're doing. Well, we have to step back from that. They're individuals and I'm a coach and I'm a trainer and I'm preparing them for success. And so while they may not be successful, they may not be perfect today, they may not, um, they may not display everything righteous and holy in their life today, what we're working towards is, is continued growth in those areas. So I have to disconnect my self-esteem and my emotional health from their successes and failures. Right? It's so easy when they're having a bad day. Well, now I have a bad day. When they're not getting through with math, well, now I'm frustrated because they're just not happy. I have to be emotionally healthy. There are some things that I can't fix. I can train them. I can prepare them. I can help them work through it, but I can't necessarily fix it. What I have to do is give them the tools and help them be able to fix it. That's, that's part of the beauty of being human is that we each are responsible for ourselves and you can't fix me. Only I can fix me with the help of the Holy Spirit um, to be more like Christ. And so what I can do is I can make sure that I'm not doing anything to contribute to unhealth. And I think that that's important as far as our parenting style when it comes to a topic like, say, math, where it's frustrating. And a lot of us would get frustrated. When my child brings me his math book, I immediately, I know my face tenses up and I just get this, I probably start to rub my head because I'm doing it right now. Uh, I just get frustrated. Well, in the same way, this is something that um, we've got to be really careful that we create that environment for our kids, that um, uh, we're excited about it. We say, hey, this is a good opportunity. This is something that we really get to do today, and it's going to help us with more than math. It's actually going to help us be successful as a life in life. And not only are you going to grow as a student, but I'm going to grow as a teacher, and I'm going to grow as a coach. Um, okay, something that uh, my quote for the day, right? Our children are foolish. Scripture says that. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We don't have to be foolish with them. So our job is to help them not be foolish and to encourage them out of foolishness. Um, it's not to be foolish alongside them. So emotional health, the first two parts of this, of really beginning to understand what makes me tick. Why do I respond in negative ways? Is this the person I want to be in this situation? How can I change that? And we've had some tools, but it really just takes work. It's, it's, it's a process where you catch yourself and stop because in this, in this spot here between stimulates and response, if we do this enough time and we do it from an emotional state, it becomes habit and it becomes much harder to break that habit because we have to actually interject it and say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Is this who I want to be as a person? Is this the message I want to send to my child or my husband or my friend or my family? Um, and, and so that process of changing the brain, because the brain tends to resist this. It just likes to do what it does. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I come to math. Math was frustrating for me as a kid. There were a lot of emotions in it, whether it was humiliation by teachers, whether it was just being overwhelmed by it, not being able to understand self-control and self-discipline as a kid myself. All these things, when my child brings that math to me and sets it down, I automatically become that in my child's life. And that's what I'm teaching them um, subconsciously, really. Okay, so... So I want to make sure that I'm in my best coaching state of mind. If I'm not, I have to be really careful to blame, not to blame my child for responding um, likewise. 
So that's number one. Number two, I have to look at, am I doing everything from an environmental standpoint to prepare my student? Uh, do I have, um, is the workspace prepared? Is it clean? Is it free of distraction? Have they eaten breakfast and had a meal that was um, good for the brain? I mean, intelligent foods are something that are important. What about sleep? Amazing how the studies about sleep and, and um, determine our ability to self-regulate, to have self-control, um, to look at things differently. So that's important. Um, what about video games and uh, entertainment? Do we realize that we lose creativity and creative abilities? We lose um, attention span and stamina when we, when we focus a lot on video games. And so if, if we're out of balance in those areas, we can't suddenly just turn it off and be a math genius the next day. It's going to take a little bit to, um, to develop some skills there. So that's, that's something that... Um, you know, those, those things too as a coach, right? I want to make sure that every member on my team has all the tools they need and um, are set up for success before we start helping them mentally. Otherwise, we're going to be fighting against that the whole time. Okay, so let's say we've got two pages of math and we're, um, our student begins to respond. What is the response? What's the emotional response? Is it anger? Is it, is it because my student doesn't want to be told what to do and when? And um, so that's a very different response than a student being completely overwhelmed and um, feeling that they just, they, they, they can't do it. That's too big of a task for them and their brain just begins to want to shut down. Or, or maybe it's just too hard. Right? Our brains are kind of lazy and learning new things. I'm having to learn some new software here. And I used to think it was the most ridiculous thing that people couldn't learn new software. Well, man, I just my brain says, I don't want to learn it. I, I don't need to learn this. I don't have the motivation. I don't have the desire to learn it. I can find somebody else to do it. I want to use the software I'm familiar with. And I'm really having to fight in this area personally and say, what kind of person do I want to be here, as opposed to just going to a default mechanism that says it's too hard, and so my response is going to be to procrastinate or find a shortcut around it. So um, that's, that's another reaction that our students can have. When I think when we come to a topic like math, my approach to it as the coach of being able to be, hey, we get to do math. Not everybody gets to do math in our culture. And to be able to learn and educate ourselves and to have the opportunity to be educated is a privilege. It's a blessing from God. Math is one of those skills that we will use throughout life. Addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, all these things that we're learning in math are valuable skills that we'll will certainly use through life. But not only that, it also helps our brain with um, creative thinking and problem solving. And these are all things that, well, we may not use all of those skills. Those, um, those traits for learning are valuable. And so let's approach it from that standpoint. Um, and uh, there are some things in life that we just have to do. Math is one of them, by law. Most of us have to do math. It's something we need to teach. It's one of the core requirements. In any standardized test, in college placement tests, anything else, students need to have math skills. So math is something that we have to do. Now, forward that 20 years. As an adult, you're going to have to go to a job, and there are going to be parts of that job that you may not always like. I love my job here at the press. I don't enjoy emails so much. and and, but I have to do emails. I have to respond and connect. And that's part of the job that I do. And so I have to discipline myself. Sometimes I have a, an egg timer that I'll flip over and I'll just, I'll, I'll remove all distractions and just spend time trying to keep up with the emails through that 20 minute period. And that's how I can train myself and discipline myself with that. But there's always going to be things in life that we don't really enjoy doing. What we need to do is train ourselves to be able to just work through those things so that we can do the things that we do enjoy doing. 
right? Um, a lot of successful people are really good at doing the things other people won't do. When we started a business, what always impressed me in getting that business off the ground was Kristen's ability to do the things most people won't do. Most people love designing marketing flyers and they love all the creative stuff, but sitting there and actually having to do the mundane work every day that keeps a business going, that's, that's a whole nother challenge. And the people who do that tend to be, they, they set themselves up for success. So with our student, number one, it's not that I'm telling you you have to. You have a choice. You can choose not to do math. And if you do, there's going to be consequences for that. Or you can choose to do the math. I'm not going to get emotionally involved in this as your coach. I'm just here to help you get through what you have to do. And, and, and what you have to do is math. Now, when we started our homeschooling journey, my daughter was extremely strong-willed. And... Um, she, we had to work with her for something. And what we ended up doing was putting her in a computerized program for a period because the computer didn't argue. The computer just stayed very benign. Here's what you do today. Here's the score you got. And if you don't invest yourself, you failed. It didn't care. She could sit there all day and kick and scream and cry and do whatever she had to do. The computer was indifferent to it. I don't recommend the computer curriculum, but what I would say is as an adult and a coach, I almost have to take a little bit more of that role. I almost have to take a little bit more of a um, uh, an indifference to this. So your job is to do math. My job is to help you do that math. I'm not getting sucked into the emotions that you have here because that's not the person I want to be in this situation. I just want to help you through this. So first of all, let's figure out why are you feeling the way you are. If you're angry and it's because you have to do something that you don't want to do, let's try to look at it a little different. Let's be thankful that we do get to do it. Let's be thankful that we had a choice in the curriculum that we chose, um, which we all do. Um, Let's be thankful for some things, and then let's approach it from that standpoint. If it's because I'm overwhelmed, well, then maybe there's a little bit that I can do to help a student that's younger, right? So let's say my student comes with math lessons level four, and there's a page in there. They look at it. I've already picked out a page, and it just has, it has multiple... Um, I'm going to switch it down to the other view if I can. So let's go down to the lab. Okay. So we have, we have this math. It's got um, long multiple addition, large subtraction, rounding, and it's got a long division problem. So this page just feels overwhelming to me today. What I can do with my child if they're overwhelmed is show them a trick and say, well, I understand that you're overwhelmed. I would be overwhelmed too if I saw the page as a whole. But what helps me sometimes as an adult is to break the big task down into small tasks. So maybe today, instead of looking at this as the entire page, let's just do this one problem at a time. Let's isolate this down to just this problem. So all we're gonna focus on right now is this problem. I don't have another piece of paper. If I did, I would probably put it over this one as well. But all we're going to focus on for right now is this. And then do that problem. Okay, now that problem's done. Let's move to this problem. Okay, good. So, so all we got to do is get through this problem. Now we've, now we've taken the task and we've broken it down into bite-sized um, objectives. Okay, so, so now we finish there. Oh, this is good. This isn't too hard. All we got to do is round to the nearest tenth and we teach them um, we teach them a skill to cope with whatever it is their fear is. Because when I looked at a full page, I was overwhelmed. If you saw my email box, it's overwhelming. But if I break my email box into a smaller task, then, then I'm able to do that. So see, what I'm doing is I'm trying to stay in a most, an emotionally healthy problem-solving mode and train my child that when they have an emotion, let's look at it creatively. And is there anything we can do to affect the situation and make it easier for us? rather than sitting there and shutting down, rather than being emotionally unhealthy. If we, if we train the student to say, who do I want to be? Do you want to be a student who is able to get good grades, who is able to accomplish things and be done? 
I would sit for hours a kid with a page like this and I would just shut down and then I would have detention for night after night after night because I couldn't do my work because I just couldn't apply myself. If I had ever been able to grasp like one problem at a time, I could have blown through a page like this fairly quickly, gotten through the work and, and had plenty of time. Now, sometimes it's difficult and it's hard. Okay, what we need to know is hard things come in life. Sometimes we really have to apply ourselves to the hard things, but, but when we do, there's a reward for, for the job well done. Can I please encourage you, reward the behavior you want. So when they go to the one problem, when they go to the one problem and they get this problem and they've done it, celebrate the fact that they finished the one problem. Celebrate it. Now, you don't, this isn't something you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. You're not going to have to sit there and tell them, whoa, yay, you paid your taxes, right? What you're doing is you're, you're, you're starting the process of training them to be emotionally healthy, to control and discipline their emotions, and to solve problems. And as, as, as this process continues, then you, you begin to give more and more of that responsibility to them. It's as a coach, think of a coach team, a team of a coach. No, a coach of a team. Think of a team of a <laughs> coach of a team. <laughs> okay. When you do that, um, he's preparing them. First day at practice, we just start building stamina. We start doing some calisthenics. Maybe we do some real basic drills. And as their, as their stamina increases and their skill, their basic ball handling skills or teamwork improves, then we begin developing more and more. Some of us may be at a place where our students are in fifth grade, sixth grade, ninth grade, and we've fought with them the whole way through here. That's tough because we are in a mode where we go to bad brain. They're in a mode where they go to bad brain. We haven't really learned the skills to problem solve or think creatively or have control of our emotions. So we just automatically default to what we know, which is the battle. And we have to have a reset and we have to say, you know what? I don't think this is the best way to do life. So let's talk about this. This is what's happening when, when we're doing this and, and we're setting a bad precedence for both of us. As an adult, I need to come alongside you and be a better coach and a mentor. And as a student, you need to apply yourself a little bit more. So let's start at the basics. What, what's, lying, what's lying here underneath all of this emotion when we have to do a subject like math? Um, I've seen a lot of times the the like as we're math lessons for a living education when a parent gets excited about it they bring that to the classroom mm -hmm. sometimes the students pick up on it but other times the student is trained themselves and through parent reinforcement to to respond negatively so what i can do in that place is disconnect myself a little bit and say okay so we got off to a bad start what we need to do is get back on track we need to find a healthier way to get through this Today it's math, tomorrow it's a job. Either way, you have to learn how to do the difficult things and find a way to be thankful for the opportunity to do that. There are so many kids who don't have that opportunity. So many kids who, who don't have the ability. And the fact that God gave you the ability to do math and that he's given us the ability to homeschool and choose a curriculum and, and be creative with problem solving. These are all things we can be thankful for as we start today. It's praying for wisdom. Beautiful thing about prayer is it causes us actually to get our head out of the problem and start being um, asking the Lord to help give us wisdom for problem solving. So bringing him in and making him a partner in your coaching, I think is essential as well, because that's something we have. It's a benefit of being a child of God is that we actually have the Holy Spirit who's called our helper, our mentor, our coach, our comforter. He's the one who comes alongside us and helps us in the task that we have. So um, with our kids, I don't think that there's a one size fits all. I think that what we have to do is, is that moment between the stimulus and the response begin to ask ourselves where who do we want to be in this situation? We look at the questions that help us have a creative response rather than an emotional response. The emotions tell us something. 
They're valuable to us because they tell us that we're either, you know, overwhelmed, fearful, anxious, you name it. They tell us something and they allow us to give us that data, but it's not a directive. So we can then um, ask better questions to have better responses. And this goes, math is an easy one as we work with our kids, but let me tell you in marriage, in, in my relationship with people I work with, um, in my church, you name it, emotionally, emotional health is such a valuable skill for our children to develop. Um, especially Facebook. I, all the time you see very emotionally unhealthy people on Facebook. They respond before thinking. They don't, they don't put in perspective, um, you know, a post goes up and immediately there's an emotional response. And then I'm offended because you did something and, and I'm offended. And I bring forward all those emotions as opposed to thinking the person who responded knows nothing about me. I know nothing about them, right? There's, there's just certain rules of conduct that get violated so easy online, but it does make us so emotional sometimes um, on Facebook. And it's absolutely ridiculous. The half of half of the issues that we deal with on Facebook have no no foundation. Um, they're just very emotionally driven. They're not creative creative problem solving or or to come out of a creative solution. So one of the things we love about this group is that um, so many of you are really good at um, constructive. You build up, you you support, you bless, and in that we've we've been able to take so much good information and build the curriculum to be a better product because we have constructive responses. So, okay, well, hopefully that was helpful. Um, please feel free to post questions. If I need to do some follow-up, I will. I'm in no way saying that I'm an expert in this. This is more of a teaching tip, something that I'm continually learning and continually trying to apply to my family. When my kids have a conflict, what I like to do is to, to try to help them analyze um, what was, what do you feel, how do, what do you want to be in this situation? Do you want to be a um, a self-centered, narcissistic person who only thinks of themselves? Do you want to be somebody who's loving and looks out for their teammates? Um, do you want to be somebody who exhibits the character of Christ in this situation? And then, and then let's look at the situation from the other point of view. What do you think the emotion that they're displaying is, is telling about them? They're angry. Why, why do you think they're angry? What do you think that that's what value um, has been tread upon that they would feel angry for? And sometimes we'll just do that with benign situations, right? And another third party that's having an argument or some kind of drama, let's pick it apart a little bit and try to examine where did things go wrong? How, what would a healthy response be here? And make it kind of a case study. Um, I'm, I'm oftentimes very transparent with my kids about my own shortcomings. And in a situation, like I said, with, um, with Kristen, where I wasn't locking the door, it was causing friction in our relationship. But the shortcoming was completely on mine in that um, it was something that she asked of me, and I didn't take it seriously. And because of that, I made her feel unsafe. Now, as a, as a husband, my job is to make sure that my family is safe and provided for. Um, it's, it's, I believe, a blessing that the Lord has given to me as a husband is to, to provide for my family. And that's, that's not just food on the table. That's also safety and security um, in many ways. So, I can show my kids that through my attitude, through the way I behaved, what I did was I, I caused an emotional response. And the only way I would ever do what was um, required or needed in the situation was when there was an emotional response. So instead of creating emotional response, let me figure out why is this important? And then what a blessing that I actually could do something so easy as to walk around the house, make sure the doors are locked and the windows are locked and make my wife feel secure and that she's provided for um, what a blessing that is. And so I look forward to that opportunity now. Okay. I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but I did. So, well, Hey, God bless you guys. Um, I know it's a challenge because 
in teaching our kids, we're also teaching ourselves. And sometimes our kids bring out the best in us, and sometimes the worst that's in us comes out as well. But what's really important is that we all grow together and that when we see these things happen and we see the emotional responses happening, that we actually take note, ask, is this the person I want to be in this situation? Is this who I want to be? And, and if it is, then good. If it's not, then at least we have some tools to start saying, okay, who do I want to be? Why do I feel this way? How can I overcome this? We won't be perfect all the time. It's a growing process. But oh, here's the beauty of it. There's no perfect. None of us are perfect. It's only in Jesus that we're perfect. And um, we are a work in progress. That is just the most beautiful thing. And not only are we a work in progress, but our kids are a work in progress too. And so that's what we want to see. We want to see progress, not perfection. And with that, I'm going to end it. Hey, guys, God bless. Be sure to comment for a chance to have 2,500 reward points added to your account. I pray the Lord's blessing on the rest of your week. And as you begin to approach some of these decisions, I really pray the Lord gives you wisdom and insight and victories and that, that you begin to see um, the blessing of emotional health in your home and your homeschool. All right, guys. Hey, have a great weekend.